If you would like to support the channel, then please turn off adblock and refresh the page. Alternatively, use the link in the description below to donate to T1 Patreon. Thank you. Hello Magic Community on YouTube, I'm T1 Glistenrelf, here with another land destruction deck tech for you for Modern. This one is a Rakdos version. Rakdos because adding black gives us a few more options that I think make this potentially worth it. And weirdly enough, even though our mana base is more expensive, the way that I have it built, this may actually be a bit more on budget for you because we're leaving out an especially expensive card. But we'll get to that in just a second. First of all, the cards themselves. It wouldn't really be a modern LD deck without Stone Rain, right? And being two in red becomes a little bit more important now that we're running two colors, but for the most part, that's perfectly alright anyway. Destroys any land, not just non-basic lands, which we'll get to in a minute. Molten Rain, again, destroys any land, but if that happens to be non-basic, hey, two free damage, easy enough. And these eight spells are not the only land destruction spells we have, not by a mile. We have four Avalanche Riders. Shoutouts to Darwin Castle for being awesome like that. This is our four mana, hates 2-2. Two -two. Yeah, it has an echo cost, but you actually in this deck find that with some frequency you may not want to pay the echo cost because of card we'll be getting to in just a moment. So I'm going to put this over here. We have four Fulminator Mages. All right, <laughs> so you know we're serious. 3 mana, 2-2, two, two, destroys only non-basic lands, though, so this will be just a 2-2 two, two for 3 in certain matchups, but the higher, the more developed that your meta gets, the more likely that Fulminator is to actually be able to destroy a land. As you get into greedier mana bases, uh, you'll find that it's more useful. Now those are all 4 ups. We have 2 Goblin Dark Dwellers. Menace and lets us flashback one of our uh, LD spells, one of our LD sorceries, for free. So very nice. Pay 5 mana, get a 4-4 four, four Menace, and destroy one of their lands. Or you have the option to cast some other spells that we have in here. Only two of them, though. They are Curve Topper. Uh, you know, 5 mana is a little bit hard to get to. But we can do that in this deck. With <laughs> It is certainly reasonable for us to especially if we're slowing our opponent down that much. Now, four Kolagons commands. Not really a land destruction spell, but you can get back your Fulminator Mages or your Avalanche Riders if you let them hit the grave. With the return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand mode, and then you get to make them discard a card, destroy an artifact, or shock. So, destroy another land next turn, and usually next turn, good creep. If you're doing both on the same turn, you are winning the game, I should hope. And you get another mode as well. Some main board artifact hate, you know, hate on affinity, combo hate in making them discard, or just take out a creature. Now, these are our land destruction and land destruction spells. We have four lightning bolts to start off our removal suite. It's a red deck in modern, of course you run lightning bolt. Uh, just keeps the opponent off of low to the ground cards that can well obviously this is rather high curve we need to stall until we get to you know casting LD after LD after LD turn after turn after turn lightning bolt helps us to get there terminate also does the job rather well if it can't be killed with lightning bolt then terminate should get the job done outside of what master of waves actually that wouldn't work bolt wouldn't work on that either uh, next we have Anger of the Gods, just as a good 3 damage sweeper, 3 mana, 3 damage, gives us yet another card that Goblin Dark Dwellers can go and get. We need to keep decks like Zoo, that have surely been hounding us until turn 3, from just taking over the game, and this enables us to do it. It is a 4 of, as is, uh, well, as are all of these. Uh, next, for our Disruption, we only run 2 Inquisitions of Kozilek for Hand Attack. Just two, we have two more hand attack spells in the sideboard. We use Inquo instead of Thoughtseize because, thanks to our land destruction spells, our opponent shouldn't get to the point where they could cast spells that Thoughtseize could get but not Inquisition. 
And so I think that that's perfectly alright in this deck. And especially against Burn, we need to not take those two points of damage. Now, we have a one of Chandra Pyromaster. There are two ways to play Chandra in this deck, I find. The first, and probably the more common, is using the zero over and over again. Uh, the zero is used to make sure that once you get into top deck mode from using all of your LD spells, you're still able to play the game. You're still in it. So you plus on your first turn because the zero shouldn't be doing that much when you've already spent four mana that turn. And then every turn after that, just zero, 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 zero. Keep up that virtual card advantage. Or, alternatively, the second way you could play her is plus, 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 minus. Just use her plus three times, and if she stays on the field, minus seven. Exile the top ten cards, hit Stone Rain or Molten Rain with them, and destroy three of their lands. And at that point, you should have the game. <laughs> It can just be silly that way. So you can use it, you can use her in either of those ways, depending on what your situation seems to be calling for. She is an astoundingly good card. Only one of though, because all planeswalkers are essentially legendary. We have a one of Liliana of the Veil. We're running black. We want to get this chick out. Uh, obviously, the minus two, the edict, is where it's at against creature decks. The plus is used against control decks. She can just take over games. Often she's a three for two. You play her, that's the minus one for you. Minus two her, edict them, now you're one for one. And if they kill her right then, okay, you've one for one. That's fair enough. But then on the next turn, you'll use her plus. Each of you will discard a card. Usually, that's making it a two for two now. And then on the next turn, edict her. So it's a two for three. Usually. <laughs> Oh, she's so good. She's so good. Oh, man. But only a one of. Uh, part of that is budget. If you can't afford another Liliana, then might I recommend another Chandra? Uh, just because I know she's really expensive. She's rocking about $100, more than $100 now. So that is certainly not on budget. But you'll notice that there's a card that's missing in here, right? Missing. And that is Blood Moon. We're not running Blood Moon. You could absolutely run the card, but now that we're running a Rakdos mana base, it does force a restriction on us a little bit more. Those of you that watch me play my Rakdos control deck, what I call Rakdos Moonwalkers, may be thinking, no, wait a minute, in that deck, you are actually running Blood Moon and it's a Rakdos mana base, but in that, I run a lot more basics. That deck is essentially a color shifted Blue Moon. This deck can't usually afford to be because of what we're doing every th with everything up here. So we want to be able to consistently have at least red red on turn three. And if we add too many basic swamps, we sh may not be able to do that. Uh, we want red red because of Molten Rain. We also want it because of Anger of the Gods. So that's why I don't run Blood Moon, saves you a lot of money there, and that's money that you can put towards cards like Liliana of the Veil vale and the Mana Base. If you consider it that way, maybe all's even, maybe they're about the same price. I think that this deck doesn't, even though it doesn't have Blood Moon, it doesn't need it as much, because we're running 16 land destruction spells, plus 2 Colin Dark Dwellers, plus 4 Colicon's Commands, I think we're fine on destroying lands while keeping ours safe. Now, this is the main board. These are the main board spells. There are 38 of them, so 22 lands. The mana base is actually a decent amount trickier, I find. The first ones are very easy. We start off with four Black Cleave Cliffs because this is our Haste land, our Scars land. This is what gives us Fast land, there we go. Both of our colors on turn one and all the way through Stone Rain mana. We want to be able to hit our opponent with Inquo or hold up Lightning Bolt. In that sense, it's rather like the Jun decks. That's what they do. That's why you'll see Black Cleave Cliffs in those decks. Next, of course, for Blood Crypts. We want to be able to keep up our uh, mana. This does give us, you know, force a little bit of life out, but it's obviously not that big of a deal in most matches. Just burn, that's pretty much it. We're rocking for Bloodstain Myers. Goes and gets the Blood Crypts, goes and gets basics. We've run a lot of basics in this deck. And that's where the easy ones end. 
Uh, next, I run one gemstone caverns because this is sort of a ramp spell that doesn't it doesn't use a ramp slot. It's a land. If we are on the draw, and if this is in our opening hand, then it essentially comes out as if it were a ley line. You just put it out on the field, give it a luck counter. It can now tap for not colorless, but any colored land. But we have to exile a card from our hand because, after all, it's like we went first, and if you're going first, you don't get that card advantage. That being the case, it's legendary, so no more than one. It's nice to be able to occasionally, one out of every not even 10 games, get out the turn to Stone Rain or Molten Rain. And that's why that's in there. It doesn't really use up, there's not much of an opportunity cost while giving us that benefit. Okay, so I'm running five mountains, basic mountains. That art in particular, because I am 13, I'm a 13 year old boy. And we run one swamp as well snow-covered swamp. You can make it snow-covered mountain. There aren't really enough snows in here to make your opponent think that you're running scred, but perhaps it comes up. Perhaps you might want to run snow-covered just because of that. Now, what do we finish this out with? There are five mountains and one swamp, so so far we have 19 of our lands. We have three more slots. How we do this next part is, I think, rather tricky. So on the one hand, we want to be able to keep up untapped lands for turn three stone rains and molten rains and fulminator mages and everything down here and color you, you get the idea but on the other hand what lands fill this slot we can't run auntie's hovel because we don't have any goblins except two dark dwellers that's it that is not nearly enough so then what well we can have smoldering marsh that one starts tapped in the early game but on turn three it can be untapped and it's fetchable on the other side, we could run Foreboding Ruins, which has kind of the opposite problem. In the early game, it's more likely to come in untapped, but in the later game, when you have fewer lands in hand, it's more likely to come in tapped. Maybe that's the right answer, but on turn three, I think that it's likely enough that we won't have an extra land in our hand, that, let alone necessarily a mountain or a swamp, that I would rather run something otherwise for the purpose of casting these spells. So then, what do you run? Those are pretty much the only ones that come in untapped. If it's going to have to come in tapped, you might as well get something great out of it. So there's Temple of Malice, which gives you a scry, that's nice, but it must come in tapped. There's Lava Claw Reaches, which gives you a creature later in the game, but again, must come in tapped. I'm running Lava Claw Reaches partially because we're not running Blood Moon, and so we're not losing a creature and creating a land that must come in tapped with Blood Moon, even with Blood Moon. Uh, that being the case, again though, this will come in tapped so we can't use it as readily for turn three plays like Stone Rain and Molten Rain. I don't know that this is right. I'm strongly considering putting in one Smoldering Marsh and two Foreboding Ruins. One Smoldering Marsh, not just because if you get two basics out, then it can come in untapped, but also if you're end of turn fetching, you can fetch for a Blood Crypt, yes, but you can also fetch for the Smoldering Marsh, where you know that it's going to come in tapped, but it's at the end of your opponent's turn, you don't really care, you just let it come in tapped, and then untap it. Just one of to give us another target, and then two Foreboding Ruins, because they give us fast lands, essentially, extra fast lands. Okay, so this is the deck as I have it right now. For the sideboard, we get into some interesting choices. I'm going to start off, we have one Batter Skull, great against the control decks. This gives us some sense of inevitability. Yes, they can counter it, but if they keep trying to remove it, well, we just return it back to our hand and cast it again later. The lifelink may also matter in certain matchups, particularly Burn, but it is on a five mana spell. Burn is one of our worst matches. If we can't keep them off of creatures and keep hitting our lands while they don't hit their burn spells, we're not getting up to Batter Skull, but this gives us something to do against Control and, yes, potentially Burn. Uh, next we have... Oh, poor, <laughs> poor Noble Hierarch. The water level just keeps rising right up to her head. No, it's all good. These are supposed to be Dragon's Claws. I have Sun Droplet instead, so... Take a nice long look at this. We're running Dragon Claw instead because, with the exception of Inquisition of Kozilek, and I think 
Let's see, one? Yeah, one sideboard card. Everything in here is red. Or colorless, I guess, in the case of Dragon's Claw, Sun Droplet. So, we would be getting, you know, more advantage out of Dragon's Claw. Cast it, potentially on that turn you can gain life. On your opponent's turn in the red decks, you gain life. You could run Sun Droplet instead, that's perfectly alright. We're not bringing them in against any deck except for Burn anyway. So I think Claw is better. That would be three Dragon's Claws. We need it. We need them that badly in the match. Next, Grim Lava Mancer. Repeatable removal. Won't hit Zoo, but it'll hit every other low to the ground deck. We can bring this in against Burn to hit what few creatures they have. We bring this in against Infect, of course. Uh, just as a one of though, you get diminishing returns from having more because the resources in your grave. You know, they're set for every Lava Mancer, regardless of how many you have. Next we have... <laughs> four Rakdos Charms. This is great utility. This can be used to fight the Graveyard decks. This can be used to fight Artifacts. And so, I bring in four. Splinter Twin isn't really a thing. There are, like, Angel Core decks now, or Kiki, Angel, whatever decks running around. Occasionally, if the opponent says, I'm going to make infinite angels, That'll be something for you, but that is a trick for which they will fall no more than once. I, generally, you're just using it for either the graveyard exiling effect, you know, making Snapcaster look silly, or fighting graveyard combo decks or other combo decks, or you're just destroying an artifact, bringing it in against Affinity. Next, we have Sowing Salt. Yes, I know, this is Crumble to Dust. I want Sowing Salt instead. The reason is because of Dragon's Claw. You're... Barely ever, I guess sometimes it could come up, but you want Sowing Salt instead. Just because you might find a scenario where you want Sowing Salt and Dragon's Claw, and then you'll get life out of it. There are very few situations where Crumble to Dust would be better. Just a slightly less restrictive mana cost, but we're already, already running so many red lands, that shouldn't be an issue. It really shouldn't. I mean, worst case scenario, every every land here generates red except one Swamp and one Gemstone Caverns, and that still leaves two red for Sowing Salt, if we have four lands to cast either one anyway. So, that should be two Sowing Salts, right? And I bring those in against Tron, <laughs> just even more land destruction. Tron and certain control matches, right? If we hit the Colonnade with it, that's game right there. This is, oh, it's such a silly card, silly good card. Uh, next we have Thoughtseize. Yeah, not Inquisition here, and that's because in certain combo decks, we're actually going to be wanting Thoughtseize so that, say, in the case of Ad Nauseam, we can hit Ad Nauseam. In the case of Scape Shift, we can hit Scape Shift. You get the idea. Uh, this just gives us more hand attack for the combo decks. And this lets us go up to uh, two Inquos, two Thoughtseize, Liliana, and four Colagon's Commands as our combo hate package. Although Liliana and Colagon's Command don't do as much because they don't force a certain choice on your opponent. That could sometimes be better if the last card in their hand is a land. Usually, though, not so much. And then two Vandal Blasts to round out our affinity hate package. So we have the four Rakdos Charms and two Vandal Blast. In addition to all of our hate cards, all of our creature removal in the main board, I think we're set for the match. I'm pretty sure. We take out our land destruction against them because Affinity really doesn't need too many lands. Their Springleaf Drums get them out. They have Mox Opals to get them out. It's not that big of a deal for them to lose their lands. And even if we had, say, a Blood Moon, Usually, they want to make colorless mana anyway, or they don't need specific colors. Outside of Master of Ethereum, Thought Cast, Galvanic Blast, Dispatch, and some sideboard cards like Spell Pierce and Thoughtseize. And that's pretty much it. Like, actual factual it. And so, this is the deck, as we have it right now. So, if you go from Mono Red to Rakdos, you're getting Colagon's Commands to loop your land destruction creatures and get something else out of it. It's our own personal cryptic command that can also serve as Stone Rain or Molten Rain. I think that this is a silly good deck, but it's a silly 
good deck. A lot of decks are too low to the ground, or they establish too much before we start destroying their lands. That's why this can't be a tier 1 deck, at least in the vast majority of metas. So, that's why, by the way, Anger of the Gods, Terminate, and Lightning Bolt are so important, and Inquisition. We need to clear up the early plays so that we can make it to the mid-game and start keeping them off of the late game. That's really where it's at in this deck. That's why it's so strong, when it's so strong. But so many decks just get out too low to the ground. Best match for this deck? Tron. Either of the major Tron variants you should be having such a good time against because you're just destroying their lands over and over and over again. Easy enough, right? And Kologon's Command hits a lot of their artifacts. They're, they shouldn't ever get to their payoff cards. They're just dead in their hand. That being the case, our worst match, I really don't know, out of the Tier 1, Tier 2 decks, my impression is that it's probably Merfolk. Fulminator Mage does less against them because of all of their basics. Really, you only get Mutavault and Cavern of Souls. Aether Vial lets them play without lands. They have Master of Waves, which is pro-rad. Uh, that being the case, it doesn't look too good for them against us anyway. We have so many, you know, Anger of the Gods should keep them off of big, you know, getting to that critical mass of toughness uh, before they can just go crazy. We don't have islands, so they need island walk with spreading seas in order to actually swing through unblockably. Uh, it's kind of a back... it seems like even that match isn't too, too bad for us. We prey on greedy mana bases, like Tron is kind of greedy, Jund is greedy, uh, the control decks, the two and three color control decks are greedy, Abzan is greedy, Soul Sisters might also be a bad match for us. Actually, you know what? No. Burn is our worst match. Burn is our worst match, no doubt. They don't need many lands at all anyway. They play super cheap spells. They don't care about getting the mid-game. They want to kill you before you get to the mid-game anyway. We put out creatures a little too slowly to be able to serve as real blockers. Our removal is nice. That is true. That is something. But not much. <laughs> Alright, so that being the case, I hope that you've enjoyed this deck tech. If you would like, uh, if you have any comments, any suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And if you want to see your own deck tech promoted on the channel, then you can put a suggestion in the comments, but if you want it guaranteed, uh, go to our Patreon and uh, donate up to that level. Every month you donate, you get your own deck tech. So, with that being the case, I will see you later. Take care, Magic Community. Bye-bye.